Kristen is a historic preservation specialist and archaeologist working for the Monmouth County Park System. Over the past decade, she's performed surveys across the Mid-Atlantic region, specializing in the contact and colonial history of New Jersey and early domestic textile production. She is currently on the board of the Archaeological Society of New Jersey. And she is here today again to talk to us about reading historic alterations in the frame dwellings of Monmouth County. So, Kristen, tell us about some techniques that historians use to help date structures. Oh, hi, Melissa. And again, thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm excited to be here. Uh, so as we all know, um, historic houses can be notoriously tricky to date. Typically, when you have an old house that survived for several hundred years, it's been altered throughout that time period, whether um, from plan changes like additions or stylistic renovations um, to unplanned changes like fires or natural disasters. But even though buildings change a lot over time, there's still a wide variety of tools that we can use as historians to help read and date these structures. Um, and a lot of these include uh, stylistic changes, or stylistic elements of the framing of the actual structure, dendrochronology sampling, historic tax records, um, various forms of historic documentation, uh, the building materials that are found inside the structure, um, archeological surveys, and deed research. So when you're looking at a historic house, the first thing you notice, whether consciously or unconsciously, are the stylistic details. And these can be a really good indicator of the structure's age. They generally serve as a good starting point. So here we see some of Monmouth County's examples um, where the architectural forms and stylistic elements hint strongly to one time period. So if we look in the bottom right corner, we see the Holmes Hendrickson house in Holmdahl, New Jersey. Um, that has a typical Dutch American sloped roof. Uh, we have um, you know, a side L in the main block. Uh, if we look above that, we see the Longstreet farmhouse. Um, this has a, a federal period um, side hall plan house with an earlier Dutch element um, to the one side. Federal houses, uh, just after the Revolutionary War time period, a lot of times they look very similar to Georgian houses, but have um, some more upscale detailing involved. Uh, if we look to the top left, we see um, the Reverend Cobb house. It's um, an Italianate structure, and Italianate structures typically have um, very long, tall windows, uh, notably flat or low pitched roofs. A lot of times they have cupolas um, and they have these um, decorative cornice brackets. So this is a very good example of an Italianate house in Monmouth County. Um, and then below that we see the, um, this house is actually in uh, Matawan, New Jersey, where I grew up. It's one of the reasons I, I learned to love history from Matawan's historic Main Street. But um, this house, uh, known as the Blue House in town, the DJ Ryer House, is a classic version of the um, Second Empire or Mansard style in, in town. And um, it's a really good example where we see these, these sloped roofs, um, either convex or concave, depending on uh, the, the site of the roof. And then there's a, a lot of various elements that really date and these stylistic changes fall comfortably within certain time periods. Um, that said, you know, style and form are often a really good first step, like I said, but they shouldn't be taken at face value. Periodic additions to houses um, and various updates can dramatically change the appearance on the outside of the structure masking its earlier history. So it's really important that we use a wide variety of techniques when we're looking at buildings. Awesome. So tell us a little bit about the techniques. We're going to start, I see here, with deed tracing. <laughs> yeah, so um, a full deed trace for a property can give you enormous insight when you're looking into when structures were built um, and who was living on the property at those times and, and how these structures were being used. So there are a variety of places uh, to search for historic deeds, but typically the best place to start is the archives for whatever county that you're in. Uh, the State Archives in Trenton have an early land records collection that covers from 1650 to um, 1801 for East and West Jersey holdings. Uh, many of the early proprietary files uh, for the state are there, but again, for most records with your county, you're going to be um, have the best bet at your local county archives. 
When you're searching for deeds, you always want to work from the known to the unknown. So you want to start with something that you know, whether it's a block and uh, book and page number or a grantor and grantee during a certain time period. Um, and you can also look up um, from a known uh, property holder now and work your way backwards through grantor grantee indexes that way. Um, Deeds generally outline property boundaries. They talk a lot about, you know, lumping in standing structures to broad categories like and all the improvements on the property or they say containing one acre of land with all the buildings and all the improvements and woods and waterways. Um, so they can be very broad, but they also sometimes show us um, small clues in those deeds that can give us a lot of information about building construction. Awesome. So you have a case study for us now, right? Yeah, that's right. So um, I was recently researching a property um, that's on the National Register as part of the Historic District of Inlaystown. Uh, that's in Upper Freehold uh, Township. And I was looking up um, specifically this one house that was on a very small parcel of land just outside the main strip of the village. So you can see it circled on this map right here. Um, the house had been really dramatically altered over time. It maintained its same footprint, but almost all of the, the stylistic details like we're talking about in that earlier um, slide um, had been changed or altered. All the windows, the doors, the siding. So it made um, dating the building by its stylistic elements really difficult. The first atlas that we have of the area is from 1851. That's that map that we're looking at the inset. And on that map, there seems to be a structure marked J. Lawrence right in the location where the house is. So we can guess that this structure or possibly an earlier structure was built at some point before 1851. But the town was first established in 1690. So that still leaves a really wide window that we're looking at for a possible construction date. Next, a deed trace was performed and we found out that James Lawrence, a wealthy landowner from Upper Freehold, had purchased the tract of land um, a very tiny piece in 1850 from Ann Ivins, who I don't know if you can see on this map is just below him, um, who owned a really large farm there. And so he purchases this, this tiny parcel. And we were confused because the Lawrences are a really wealthy family in Upper Freehold at that time. Um, and it seemed really unlikely that James Lawrence would live in such a modest house. And we actually know from additional research that James Lawrence lived in this house, a very beautiful uh, federal period brick, brick house that's also in Upper Freehold Township. So um, he, through the um, 1851 map, we looked around and we saw James Lawrence owned seven different properties across the, across the township at that time. Um, so it's really likely that he was renting these properties as tenancies. And that was even further reinforced because this house, um, when we looked at it structurally, was built as a, um, a duplex. So it could house two families completely independently. And also you could see that GM right on the map. Um, so that's the gristmill in town. So the, he bought this small parcel of land directly across from the mill and this little milling village. So it's a perfect um, you know, tenant property that he, he built. So we know that he's renting this property to workers, but the question remained, was the house there at that time um, that he purchased it in 1850 or was it built after he acquired it? Well, James Lawrence dies in 1860 and his holdings are sold off by his executors at a public sale. And there's a deed that's here on the, on the left um, that talks about the presence of a certain dwelling house that's on the lot. And we already know based on the historic maps from uh, 1851, 1861, that there's a house on that property. But the deed includes another really valuable piece of information. So um, it later references the new house which uh, was built by said James S. Lawrence. So we have, uh, we know that he buys the property in 1850 and it's talking about the fact that he built that structure. Um, so, and it appears in 1851 on the map. So we have a really tight date range. And when we looked at the house structurally um, through the building techniques and the various materials on the inside, it did fit really comfortably within that mid 19th century range. So we, we got pretty lucky in this instance um, because it had such a strong clue in the deed. Um, but there's also a lot of other indicators that you can pull from deeds. Um, take, for example, if you have a parcel that was purchased for $400 at the time, and then 10 years later, it's purchased for $4,000. 
um, we can tell generally that some large improvement is made to the structure at that time. Um, it's always worth looking into the economic <laughs> um, climate at that time, whether it's a war, things can affect uh, prices. But typically, if you have such a large jump in a short amount of time, it means that they're building a dwelling, they're building new barns, they're improving the property um, in such a substantial way. And uh, that can be a really good indicator about when structures are added. That is such a fascinating example. Like, you know, when students are, are doing research and um, dare to perhaps suggest it's boring, I said, what, this is the most exciting <laughs> work ever. So, all right, so deeds definitely a good source to turn to. Um, I think you're gonna talk about tax records next. Right, so tax records, when they exist for a, a time period in question, they can be another really good resource um, to help identify the age of a portion of a building particularly. So an early federal tax was issued um, for the new nation in 1798. It wasn't the first federal tax, but um, this federal tax is important because um, it enumerated how many windows a building had, and it also listed the dimensions of the buildings. Um, and in addition to that, it talks about how many kitchens are associated with the dwelling house um, and talks about overall outbuildings. So when we're talking about trying to understand parts of these houses that have been expanded over time, when you can find out the size of these earlier sections, it can really help you decode um, where the smaller parts of the house and the earlier parts of the house are. And so, like I said, it's really very useful to understand growth patterns. Here's a good example. So the house that you see here is the Holland Activity Center in um, Tatum Park in Middletown, New Jersey. And this example has clearly grown over time. Um, today, stylistically, we see a large structure with colonial revival details that came from the earliest cent uh, 20th century. Um, that were done by Charles Tatum and then restored later by the park system in 2016. But structurally, there are portions of the house that show building techniques um, that date to the early 18th century. So we know that there's some early 18th century elements in here, and the question is, what parts? To get a better idea of the evolution of the house, we can look at those early historic records for the property. And so through our deed trace that we did, we know that the parcel was owned by Henry Stryker during the period of the um, 1798 tax. So he shows up, uh, you can look on this list right here, he shows up right towards the middle of the list. And on the tax uh, record, we see that he owns a large 164 acre parcel in Middletown and it includes two structures. So he has one structure that measures 22 by 30 feet. It's one story, has three windows. Um, and the other structure measures 28 by 40 feet. It's one story, has six windows. When, um, when we're looking in this instance, there's, um, hold on, I jumped around here. The early section of the um, Holland Activity Center that shows these 18th century uh, building techniques. So here we see a uh, corner fireplace, which is really typical in 18th century houses. Um, we have this portion of a field stone foundation. So not the entire foundation was field stone, only in certain sections. Um, the section that has these early details measures uh, 22 by 30, which is the same size as that early, uh, one of those early structures. So um, we know now that the house evolved from basically this two room, five bay structure and, oh, the two room, one story dwelling in the 18th century. And then it expands later, again, we know through historic documentation, um, to this two-story five bay structure. Um, and when we're talking about bays, we're talking about um, typically the number of windows or door openings. So you can count across that would be a five bay structure. And generally when you're doing and you're looking for additions, you see a lot of symmetry. Um, when they're doing the design. So one of the ways that we can see this expansion today, if you look at the middle chimney, um, that really frames that, that portion very nicely. Uh, that dormer wouldn't have been there at the time. So you can picture what this, this five bay two story structure would have looked like um, edged by both of those chimneys. Um, and the house is expanded again in the mid 19th century uh, with the addition of this three bay section over here. Uh, and then in the early 20th century, Charles Tatum adds a new kitchen um, and a large ballroom, and he completes a lot of these colonial revival additions that we see in this picture. 
Awesome. So we've looked at deed research and tax records. What are some of the other documents that people should look to when trying to date their historic structures? Um, so there's several types of um, historic documentation that can really aid researchers in narrowing down a construction date or understanding the series of additions. Here's a few examples. Um, the sketch drawing to the left is an 1810 historic road return. So when roads were laid out or they're changed and abandoned, surveyors would sketch out the portion of the road in question and then report the submitted um, road return to the county. And there are over 700 such maps on file at the archives in Monmouth County. Um, so it's always worth taking a look to see if they're uh, available for the area that you're looking at. And those um, road returns date from 1830 all the way to 1973. So there's a pretty wide range there. And on this map, we can see a section of Homedale um, that's now part of Thompson Park. And the one story three bay house in the upper right corner that's listed as the heirs of John Smock, if everyone can see that. Um, so that building is subsequently owned by his son, Rulof Smock, and then by his grandson, Peter R. Smock. And so now we can actually look at some different types of documentation. So the um, sketch drawing to the right is an inset from the 1851 map that we looked at earlier. Um, and that showed some of the best examples of really fine architecture in the county. So we were lucky in this case that it actually showed this structure. Um, so we get a nice sketch drawing of what it would look like in 1851. And at that time, we can see it's grown um, substantially. There's this dramatic three bay side hall Greek revival addition um, to what was probably an expansion of that earlier structure. If you look on the road return, you see what looks like a one and a half story three bay house. So that's probably looking at um, that right hand section that's now been expanded to a full two stories. And there's um, some wings to the east end of the structure. Um, there's uh, the big porches that are there. Um, and then when we look at the local county uh, historic sites inventory that was done in 1980, 1980 to 1985, um, they went around and, and uh, documented all the historic structures they could find in the county. Um, so that's what this picture on the bottom is from, from 1985. Uh, and we can see there's been a lot of changes again, that large um, Greek revival, uh, you know, porch that we have with those tall columns has been removed and it's been made a little bit more uh, modest at that time. And that second porch has been removed. There's been a, a, a few um, changes. But then um, almost immediately after this photo was taken, the house was demolished um, and it was kind of a nasty land development deal. And now the property is actually part of Thompson Park. So the archeological remains are in the park um, awaiting a field school or a future survey to learn a little bit more about the structure. But, um, and then in the upper right hand corner, you can see at one point the property was advertised for sale in the newspaper. And although this one only talks about the acreage, um, a lot of times these newspaper articles will give a lot more detail about the historic structure and tell you how many rooms um, and about some of the outbuildings as well. Um, I... Oh, so local historic surveys, um, like the one I talked about for Monmouth County, uh, a lot of times those are available in varying states throughout your, um, your different counties, but they can be a really invaluable resource because um, there's already a lot of compiled research in those files, so you don't have to do everything by yourself from scratch at that point. Awesome. Um, do we have a sample about the Seabrook Wilson House coming oh, up? Oh, that's right. Right. So um, another example of visual documentation um, that we have in the historic record includes paintings and postcards um, and, and historic sketches. So this painting um, in the upper right corner was created in the mid to late 19th century. And you know, artists can and do take a fair amount of creative license when they're, um, when they're drawing details on artwork. So it can't be taken as 100% um, you know, accurate all the time. But images like this can really help researchers understand the development of major additions over time. So here we're looking at the Seabrook Wilson House and it's clear in the painting um, and in the 19 or the 1896 photograph in the bottom image 
um, that this upper floor, this upper story is built in multiple sections. Um, when you look at that, that, um, that photograph, you can look at the roof and you see the shingles are different in two different sections. So that would already be an indicator that that, um, that floor was not created all at the same time. It was probably done in two sections. But when we have this painting, we have um, an earlier example of what it looked like before that addition was completed across the top. Um, indicators inside the house and historic records helped architectural historians date various segments of the house and these dates were then reinforced through the structural indicators um, found on found during the renovation uh, during 2008 so they did a historic building survey and um, were able to kind of break down the interior of the house to different periods of development which is what you see on the right um, and that was for the, the renovation in 2008 so interesting to me how we can find so many different sources like you said the paintings you know who would have thought that one day those paintings would be used to try to date the structure it's just so interesting absolutely and we actually even during the renovation um you could see the porch detail like the um you see those like kind of peach and blue stripe painting on the on the bottom of the porch they actually drew from the um, painting and now at the house during the renovation that it has the same coloring that was shown in this picture so uh they use details from the painting to replicate during their the restoration so fascinating. Um, you mentioned maps earlier. I think you're going to go into those in a little bit more detail now, how they can be used. Right. So there's a really surprising number of uh, detailed maps that are available for public viewing and they're in the public domain. Um, for my county, for Monmouth, for example, we have um, the 1851 map, uh, a Jesse Lightfoot map, and the 1861 Beers Atlas that are available for free on the Library of Congress, which is loc.gov. If you've never checked it out for um, your county or even just type in New Jersey and search maps, you'll find a wide variety going back to the 17th century, even um, from some of these early Dutch explorers. And um, for your specific county, there's a lot of uh, later detailed maps from the mid 19th century. Um, another resource that I use professionally is um, historicmapworks.com. If you want to replicate the map, you have to pay for it, but a lot of times it has a really nice compilation of different late mid to late 19th century maps that you can view um, with you know, watermarks and whatnot, but they're good for research purposes. So you can zoom in pretty close and be able to see, um, see your area. And um, these, there's a, a variety of other places to, um, there's like a Dan Leventhal's maps um, that are on a separate website. There's Rutgers has a cartography page. Um, and one of the things that is really cool is that uh, Princeton University um, just put all of their historic Sanborns online. So Sanborns are, um, oh, here are some of the examples of the maps that I was uh, just talking about. And you can see some really good property details, especially as you get into the later portion of the 19th century. Um, so Sanborn maps uh, were fire insurance maps that were created um, at pretty regular intervals. And Princeton, like I said, has just put their entire Sanborn map collection online on an interactive viewer. So I would highly recommend checking that out if you have time. Um, and you can download these all for free from their website. Um, so one of the incredible things about Sanborn maps is, is the level of detail that we're looking at. So you can tell the building material um, based on color. So blue in this picture is stone and um, the yellow represents frame, frame houses. Now you can tell what the roof is made out of. Um, you can tell where the chimneys are located. You can tell how many stories it is. And beginning in around 1890, they were done roughly every 10 years or so. So what's really cool is that you could see buildings start to change over time. So this is an example um, from the same block in Asbury Park uh, from 1890 and then 1905. And you can see a lot of changes um, that have happened. Some new buildings have been constructed at uh, block 510 and uh, 904. Um, in addition, there's now several more back houses. And that Presbyterian church that's in the bottom corner appears to have acquired that neighboring lot and really expanded. Um, and now the church um, is, is brick. So it seems like they rebuilt the structure completely or not brick, but masonry rather. So it's probably stone. Um, and they rebuilt that structure completely at that time. And equally interesting are like the small details in these properties. So if you look at say um, 
building 514 in the upper right corner. We can see that that's extended and now has a wraparound porch and it has a bay window and it has um, all these little details that you can really date to a pretty tight 10 year range um, when these additions are taking place. Um, and then besides Sanborns, uh, it's not quite maps, but uh, historic aerials are, are really useful as well. So um, I often go on historicaerials.com. As you see, obviously, they want you to pay if you're going to reproduce any of the maps. But just from a research standpoint, it's really useful. They have um, some new layer comparison uh, tools that basically what you're seeing on this picture is um, the map from 1920 overlaying a map from uh, what does this say? 1979. So you can use the slider and kind of see when buildings change. If you're looking for something that disappeared or where it would be located on today's landscape, um, you can put a modern aerial and kind of slide over and find exactly where that structure was. So it, it can be very, very useful. Um, and you can see additions. as well. Um, and then um, just aerials and historic maps. You also have historic um, American building surveys that were done. And so those are available on online for free at the as the National Register surveys under the Library of Congress again. So if you type in loc.gov um, and then you look up the historic American building survey and you look up your county, you can see all the um, HABs drawings and, um, and photographs that were taken and done at that time. And sometimes it's not, I'm not showing it here, but they get really detailed. I mean, talking, they draw the, all the hinges for doors and they draw the mantles and they have all the hardware. So we were just doing a restoration project at the Holmes Hendrickson house that we'd looked at earlier. And we were able to pull um, the Habs drawings and see some of the original hardware. Um, and we're able to do some replication from that hardware that was drawn on the Habs map. So that's pretty great. In this photo, we're looking at the um, Navajo Lodge. It was part of a 1901 development in Long Branch called The Reservation. Um, it was built by Nate Salisbury. He was the co-owner and manager of the Buffalo Bills Wild West Show, if you can believe it. And um, the Navajo Lodge is the last remaining structure from this development. And its former location of the reservation is now what is Seven Presidents Oceanfront Park. And the building was moved further north, and the part uh, the building was later uh, rehabilitated as the Park Systems Activity Center. But you know, even for little elements like we're redoing the roof this year, you know, it's always good to go back to these Habs drawings to be able to um, see details and elements that uh, could be helpful during restoration. Awesome! Thank you so much for that detailed review of the documentary sources that are available. I think I'm going to waste a lot of time on historicaerials.com, so I'm a little nervous about that. <laughs> um, tell us now a little bit about reading the structure itself. Right, so again, you always want to start with that background research, but there's really nothing better than getting into the structure yourself and being able to take a review. So perhaps the, the most important investigatory tool are the building materials. Um, and today, when we require more living space, we typically move to a new house. <laughs> um, we, and historically, people would not really want to move their entire farm, entire family, and you have, um, you know, long family homesteads in certain areas. So they're gonna be adding additions to existing structures uh, more often than not. Um, sometimes building new structures from scratch, but for the most part, you, you economize and you, you're adding to an existing structure. Um, and so these images represent some common addition forms that we see in Monmouth County farmhouses. Um, however, the construction of additions doesn't always follow the same patterns. Uh, it's very unique, but there, there are some um, general trends that we do see. So the top two images or the two images, yeah, at the top, they represent the same structure. This is the Aaron Long Street house in Homedale. And in the older photo, that's from a HAB survey, actually. Um, it's easy to visualize that earlier one-story frame 18th century cabin um, that you would have had, followed by that two-thirds plan brick addition that's to uh, the left. And it was common for these original um, smaller cabin areas to be expanded this way with an adjacent three bay side hall plan um, addition. And sometimes that shed lean to that we see is also very common uh, against an original cabin. 
Um, and sometimes a full five bay addition uh, would be added to the house. That's shown in the Garrett Conover house, that white house kind of sandwiched in the middle to the right. So we have the earlier structure um, and then we had a full five bay um, addition that was added to that early structure. <clears throat> And so if we look at the Dennis uh, or Denise Hendrickson house below that, we could see what looks like a very similar um, evolution, except that that one has a nice gambrel roof, but it's still that two thirds um, side hall addition. Um, and then we're looking, it, it doesn't, you have to be careful though, because a lot of times you want to say, okay, that's the smaller portion of the house and they built the bigger addition, but that's not always the case. So if we look at the Dutch Reformed Church Parsonage in the bottom left, um, the earlier section is actually that side hall plan of the house and the additions are those two um, periods to the right. And so it can look very similar, but that's when you really need to kind of get into the house to be able to see um, you know, a little bit beyond because some things that look obvious from the outside are a little bit less obvious from the uh, from the inside. This is not necessarily my area of expertise. So it's so <laughs> fascinating to me when you put these pictures next to each other, how it really does become evident that there's this common addition form, you know? <laughs> right, right. And, right. and every area has its own own traditions, right? So in Monmouth County, we do have a lot of frame structures that remain on the landscape. Um, but when you get into, I know I heard somebody say that they're from Bucks County and, you know, I used to live out that way in Pennsylvania and you have a lot of stone structures and they're going to have their own addition methods, um, you know, whether it's stone and frame. And so a lot of it is very regional to a certain degree. Um, even in Western Monmouth County, you get a lot more brick structures. Um, so yeah, it, it is very regional and it, you know, one rule doesn't fit all, but uh, there are are definitely trends out there that you can kind of train your eye to, to pick up on. Okay, so as far as the timber framed houses go though, talk to us a little bit more about analyzing that structural framing. Right, so when you get inside, if you can get into a portion of the structure where you can see that frame, um, they can provide a really good date range um, for timber framed houses. So here in the, um, the upper left, we see post and beam framing. So that's kind of the, the earliest form of uh, timber framed houses that you're going to find. It's typically heavier timbers. Um, and, um, the, you know, this technique is using a lot of lumber. It's using a lot of heavy lumber. And, um, you know, as settlements, you, you have the availability of a lot of this lumber in these earlier days of development, right? When you're, you're coming into new areas that have a lot of native timber. Um, and instead, uh, these heavy timber houses, they're constructed with wooden pegs um, rather than nails, which, you know, may, you have to make those by hand at the time. So a lot of times it's, you know, a little bit harder to get materials when you're in a more remote area. So you're making um, these mortise and tenon joints and it's, it's pretty skilled labor uh, of the way the pieces fit together. So a lot of times they're being made within communities. Um, and when you have these heavy timber frame houses, you can generally tell uh, the studs are generally um, 24 inches apart on center. So if you can measure the distance between some of the studs, um, it can also help give you an indication of time. So when and why does the use of post and beam start to decline? So there's several reasons why post and beam wanes in the mid, early to mid 19th century. Um, as settlements grew and farmsteads grew, the available of this old timber, um, it, it, it declines. You just have less availability. And at the same time, the growth of these communities gives you more shared resources, right? So you have now access to a sawmill or you have um, the availability of now mass produced materials like cut nails. Um, so that is going to change your building techniques. It saves time, it cuts, cuts costs. Um, so the availability of skilled labor is also declining a little bit as people are specializing. And um, it opens the door to balloon framing. So if you look at balloon framing, it's much easier to construct. Balloon frames typically use these very long studs. You can tell they go up the entire side of the building. Um, and they extend from the bottom floors all the way to the upper floors. They're spaced about 16 inches apart on center, but they're much lighter than heavier uh, timber frame post and beam structures. 
and houses could be constructed by just a few individuals uh, because of the lighter frame um, rather than an entire community. So savings in material and labor costs, um, they made these houses just more affordable and cheaper. Balloon frame houses were constructed with one extremely dangerous flaw though, um, because the studs run completely from the bottom floors all the way to the top. Um, if a fire breaks out, say on the bottom floor, those studs act like a chimney and the fire can spread from the bottom floor all the way to the attic in, in seconds. Um, so they were actually fairly dangerous. Sometimes they would add a spare sill plate to be able to break up those long chimney like studs. But, um, but yeah, they did have that flaw that even despite that flaw, they remained popular through the 19th century into the early 20th century. Um, by the 1930s, we get, um, so this is the example, I was on the wrong slide, uh, this is the example of balloon framing here. Um, by the 1930s, we get platform flame, framing. So construction technique no longer, no longer required these very long studs um, and these very tall straight trees. Um, you could construct the house on its own platform, one on top of the other. Um, so you need a less specific um, pieces of lumber. And again, that cuts into costs and makes it cheaper. And platform framing also kind of made it a little sturdier and cut out that, that dangerous flaw that you see in balloon framing. Aside from these structural framings, we can look below the surface um, and illuminate a little bit more about the building's origin or even just some of the details. Um, so I was just driving by Red Bank the other day and I had to pull over and take a picture of this because it's such a nice example of some of the things that you get to see during renovation, right? So I pulled over and you can see that they're, um, they're modifying the windows, but the original windows uh, would have been much larger. So you could see how they've kind of boarded up the sheathing um, below or whether or not they would have been larger or just placed lower on the facade. And there's definitely been some sort of window alteration that's been patched up over time um, as things have been modified. So when you're doing um, renovations and you, you wanna look for these kind of little details and scars and little witness marks that tell you that changes have been made. Um, and uh, it really gives you a better idea um, to orient yourself into the earlier spaces that are there. Awesome. So Kristen, we are running a little short on time. So I wonder if we could make sure we discuss the dendrochronology, because I think that is something that people might not have as much of an awareness of, that technology. Absolutely. So just to um, jump ahead here, so real quick, um, saw marks too, you hand tune, pit sawn, vertical milled or circular milled also give you an indication of time. Um, but we're gonna hop ahead to dendrochronology. So dendrochronology is tree ring dating and it can be a really useful tool. In this case, um, boring samples are taken from a wood frame uh, structure and they're compared against a regional database um, to identify when the date that the tree was harvested uh, for the lumber because you can compare effects in the rings from periods like drought, um, storm events, they show up chronologically in these rings. Um, but there's some good examples of how this has been used successfully. So this is the T. Thomas Fortune House. Um, it was going under a restoration. It's now a community and cultural center. And um, for many years, it was assumed that this house was built in the mid to late 19th century based on its structural um, and stylistic details from the exterior. It looks kind of like a mansard style, um, eclectic house. But when the walls were opened up, uh, it was immediately obvious that the main block of the house um, outlined in red below um, had that heavy post and beam construction uh, and these hand hewn beams that lead us to think an 18th century date. So um, a dendrochronology study was performed by uh, Dr. Richard Veit of Monmouth University. And he was able to sample some main blocks of the house to date that to a period of about 1774. And the second empire details that we see later um, were part of a remodeling effort uh, and a, an addition and some rest, uh, renovation that were done um, prior to when Fortune purchased the house. But even though there's a lot of great things about dendrochronology, there's also a lot of um, drawbacks. So first and foremost, uh, you need a piece of lumber that shows that exterior edge because you need an endpoint when that tree was cut down. And sometimes it can be very difficult to find enough sampled pieces of lumber that show that edge 
um, that live edge or wany edge um, for you to get your samples. But also, if you take a look at this photo, um, you can see that those mortars and tenons are just not lining up properly. And that's because this lumber was used from a previous structure. So um, it was used probably from an earlier barn and used to create this 19th century barn and they kind of retrofitted the holes in the pegs um, so that they could use it. But if you dendrochronology to a structure that's reusing old lumber, um, you're going to get a date from the previous structure rather than the structure that you're looking at. So it does have its own faults. Um, and just I'll blow through quickly. Lastly, archaeological surveys can tell you a lot about um, additions that are no longer there. If you look at foundations, um, also the historic artifacts that are in the ground surrounding can tell you a lot about time and occupation. Um, and just in conclusion, uh, historic houses in today's landscape, they're often a wide variety of periods and construction and renovation and additions. Um, but when you learn and use some of these tools uh, to help you read the physical signs and you know where to look to perform the research, uh, you can really crack their secrets and kind of decode and deconstruct um, the periods of development for historic houses. I love the way you end that, talking about cracking their secrets, right? Uh, thank you so much, Kristen, for that really informative talk. Let me now open the floor for questions or comments from our audience. Who would like to go first? I explained it so well, there's no question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so perhaps everyone's looking for their mute button and whatnot. Let me throw a question out there. You mentioned this briefly, um, especially when talking about the maps. How much information is available online, right? I know I was just doing some deed research um, with Ocean County properties, um, and I was amazed at how much had been digitized and could be accessed online, which is a boon under normal circumstances, but especially now during, you know, COVID when you can't access sites and right. things like that. Um, so how much of this do you find is accessible online and, and how often do people have to actually go into the archives? Um, so a tremendous amount is online. It's, it's really amazing if you, if you know where to look and I am constantly adding things to my bookmarks when I find a new resource that has a lot of these primary source documents that I'm looking for. I always save it so that I can continually go back and work on them. Um, but there are just from maps, a lot of things that are, like I said, in the public domain and are a part of Like I said, you can go down a rabbit hole on Library of Congress and spend hours looking at old maps. Um, but even things like the deeds. So the deeds for Monmouth County, there's this uh, website called familysearch.org and all the deeds for Monmouth County are available um, up and through, I wanna say through 1920 or so, are available online and you have the grantor and grantee indexes, you have all your various books and pages. So you can go into the archives and do this research yourself on the microfilm. Um, but a lot of times if I'm just pulling a quick deed or I need to do a quick lookup, I just go to my computer and I go online and I'm able to pull the deeds that I need and then I can go to the archives after and fill in that missing section if I need it. But I mean, there are really a tremendous amount of resources online. For Monmouth County particularly, I made a research guide um, that I give to people sometimes if they're looking for properties in our county. And it has a whole list of online resources that they can use themselves. So if anybody's interested, uh, my contact information will be at the end of this. So um, I, I'll make sure uh, to, to send that your way if you'd like to take a look at it. Awesome. Yeah, Emily, maybe we can get that on our education webpage eventually. Yeah, no, there's a lot of great links that you've mentioned, Kristen. I've been trying to drop some of them in the chat. Um, really, yeah, really interesting. So it looks like um, Terry Prancis has his, his hand up. Um, and then also it looks like Janet has a question as well in the chat. So I'm just going to say, okay. please feel free to use the chat room too, folks. Awesome. So Terry, why don't you go ahead? Okay. Thanks, Melissa. Um, and, and thank you for this great presentation, uh, Kristen. Uh, I'm going to make a comment on Sanborn. I use it quite a bit. I've developed uh, some, some walking tours. Um, they may become virtual tours for Hoboken Historical Museum. And one of them is called Hoboken Grit, and it's a, a view of our industrial past. So uh, luckily, we have a number of uh, adaptive reuse industrial structures. Uh, we also have a few that are, that are unfortunately on the way out 
um, but by using Sanborn, which the museum has in its online archives, um, periodically we're able to see uh, at different points in time. But if um, I didn't have that through the museum or if somebody's doing research, the museum is not, certainly doesn't have every 10 years. They have something from the, let's say the early 1900s, something from the 1930s, something from the 1950s. If somebody really wanted that 10 year increment and their usual source doesn't have it, where might it be found? Uh, like I said, for New Jersey, um, I think Princeton has put their entire archive online. But the thing to remember is that not every town did them as regularly as other towns. So that one example I showed you from, um, from Asbury Park, for example, that was a 15 year jump between 1890 and 1905. I think there was another one in 1915 and then maybe not another one until 1940. So, you know, 10 years was kind of a, a rough example, but every town has, um, has kind of these different ranges. It wasn't something that was done at a regular basis. Um, but if you go to Princeton, you can zoom into your area and it'll show you all the ones that they have. And I'm fairly certain that they have a pretty exhaustive list of what's out there. I mean, smaller um, local archives or county archives might have things that, that they don't, but they, they do have a very wide resource. So that would always be my first place to, to go check. Great. It's, it's quite useful because we see a building and it wasn't there before. Right. The earlier one and then it's there in the later one and sometimes the usage. They are very detailed if you've not worked with them. They, they do show um, particularly these industrial sites which, which company owned it and sometimes you'll see a name and then you'll see the name and sons. Or, yeah. You'll actually see the progression just by looking at the maps or, the, or as you pointed out certain structures will go from from wood only to um, to to something else, to to metal um, add-ons or to uh, stone or brick add-ons or or a, or a total change. Thanks, Terry, for that question. I have one in the chat from Janet. Janet writes, "It would be so nice to see through the walls to see the framing. Early English and early Dutch timber framed houses can look pretty similar outside. Any right. tip?" for identification without destructive testing as, oddly enough, many homeowners don't want you to walk in with a crowbar. <laughs> We, you know, we, we have the same argument all the time. I, I find it so frustrating where you just want to like lift that last layer and be able to see what's going on because so often during renovation and restoration, you're surprised. You remove something that you thought you completely understood and then you open it up and it's not what you expected at all. Um, one good example of that Dutch that Dutch framing that we're talking about. So that Holmes Hendrickson building um, that I showed earlier that had that kind of classic Dutch slope. It looks like a purely Dutch structure from the outside. But when you go inside, you actually find there's a really unique framing inside where it's kind of turned rather than just the classic H bends. There's a modified like half Dutch, half English framing on the interior of the house. And What's so interesting is that you have the Dutch Hendricksons and the English Holmes, and they intermarry, create this house, and it uses techniques from both of their, their backgrounds. And so when you see beyond just that classic Dutch slope, there's really these two different elements that are coming from two different cultures. And it's almost like seeing the family visualized in their own architecture. It was really, really interesting to to see that development because again when you look at it from face value you see a dutch house and you don't necessarily get all that additional information about the these english elements that are built into the structure as well so yeah i sympathize and i i have the same problem where sometimes you just wish that you could uh have x-ray specs or something to be able to see a little bit beyond um because a lot of times when by the time you see some of this information it sometimes is too late when they're demolishing a building and you're driving by and you see these 18th century timbers um, and, you know, it just looked like a, a modern aluminum sided house at that point with modern windows. Um, you know, you, you really want to see beyond a lot of the time. So until you're willing to, to rip them open a little bit, sometimes it's, it is difficult to tell. That's so interesting about the family's different cultures being represented in the architecture. Right. Um, so Taylor says, thanks for this great presentation. In my research, I have found that many people who research their houses base the date built on real estate websites. However, most of the time those dates are wrong and Kristen's laughing. So obviously she's, 
she agrees. <laughs> um, so, do you know where those dates came from? Taylor asks. Uh, so I get into this argument all the time with people, especially we have um, a land development team just downstairs that, with, that we work with and they're purchasing up all these parcels and they say, oh, this building's from 1901. See, it says on Remax and you say, that is, you know, that's an 18th century structure. That is an 18th century farmhouse. That is not 1901. Um, so I haven't confirmed this, but I am fairly certain that there must have been some sort of change in the early 20th century in the way that tax records were, were, were put in or something because you get a huge slew of these houses that are listed in 1901, 1910, or 1915. And I don't know what happened during those time periods, but I see it all the time when you're looking at these um, real estate records and they say one of those three dates um, really early in the 20th century. And it blows my mind because again, I don't know what happened during the, the tax records at that time that that redated all these houses, but the dates have stuck. And so you get it all the time, especially with 19th century structures, which are a little bit harder to tell if they're 19th or 20th to the untrained eye and people take at face value, the date that comes along with it and say, oh, it's from 1910. And you're like, no, that, that is, you know, that's Greek revival that this it's 1840. But again, you know, a lot of people, they see those dates and they take them at wholesale. And that's my only inkling is that something must have changed right around the early 20th century that that brought these dates along with them. So yeah, it's very frustrating. I deal with it all the time though. I, that made me laugh. That's a mystery one of us needs to tackle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, we've got time for one more question, which I have typed in the Zoom chat here from Michael Skelly. So this will be our last question. How can you tell if a set of internal stairs have been moved or replaced? We suspect that the house has an 1800 set of stairs in a 1770s house. So that, again, every, every house and every structure is so unique. When you have, um, and this is where I tend to rely a lot on classic building techniques for that time period. So if you have, you know, say you're thinking about an 18th century cabin and you have this one room cabin with a large, um, large mantle, and typically you're going to have um, your staircase to the upper loft is gonna be like a side, um, it's often uh, hidden behind cabinetry um, in the wall. Uh, it's going to be the staircase that goes up and around the mantle into this loft area. Um, and we were recently in a house in Middletown where there was this side staircase that went around a mantle um, that looked like it could have been covered behind a wall and it's this 18th century structure. But we were able to tell that the staircase wasn't original and that it was from the 19th century based on several things. So we looked at the floor and we saw um, part the, the, the floor showed evidence of where the earlier staircase had been changed or where the staircase was and had been changed. Also underneath the staircase, we were able to see some of the saw marks. So I had to kind of um, blow through that saw marks line, but saw marks can be really useful. So if it's hand hewn or if it's pit sawn um, and you have these earlier um, cutting methods, you know, you typically have an earlier or older structure. When you see uh, vertically sawn lumber, it has a, its own unique date range. And same with circular sawn. So we really don't get circular saw marks until a very specific time period. I think the first blade was made in the 1780s, but it really wasn't used widely, um, especially in the United States until at least after like the 1830s or so. I have to double check my times on that. But when you see some of these really tiny indicators like your saw marks, like your nails, um, when you're looking at things that are holding the structure together, is it, um, you know, is it a, a, um, hand wrought nail or is it a cut nail or is it a wire nail? You know, all these things have their own unique date range and they can help you date what you're looking at. So without knowing the, you know, the specifics of that one house, I always go to the materials. You know, what's the wood look like? What do the, what do the nails look like? And what do the elements around it look like? Are there evidences of something that's there that was earlier? Thank you, Kristen. Well, I'm sad to say that we are officially out of time, so we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much, Kristen, for sharing your expertise, for deftly handling all of the questions that we had. Um, if I could just get the next slide on the screen, please. This is Kristen's contact info for anyone who would like to continue the conversation. 
Uh, we'll go back to that after. <laughs> yeah, next up on Q&A with PNJ, we will have developing walking tours with Kathy Kelly, who is the owner of Paranormal Books and Curiosities and runs uh, historic walking tours of Asbury Park. That'll be August 19th at 1 p.m. again on Zoom. And the registration info will be available on our website and on social media shortly. So we hope we will see you all there. Um, please be sure to connect with Preservation New Jersey. Uh, continue to support us. Our newsletter just went out. I hope you didn't miss that. Uh, and yes, that brings us to a close. Emily, anything else you would like to add? No, just thanks everyone for joining. This was, thank you, Kristen and Melissa for coordinating this session. It was fantastic. And again, yeah, please always just reach out to us if you have ideas, if you want to become a member, uh, if you want to be added to our newsletter list. This is all our contact information right here. So thank you, everyone. This was great. Okay. Thanks again for having me. This is, this is great. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Have Kristen. a great day, everybody. Bye-bye. All right. Bye, everyone.